voter turnout ever this election year, and Jefferson Keel said that in his State of Indian Nations address. And we just wanted to be able to make sure that all the Native nonprofits were equipped and ready to um, lend a hand to reach this goal. And we wanted to be able, we also wanted to be able to make sure that we protected your funding sources and that you know what you can and can't do um, when you're helping to mobilize Ameri you know, um, all of our, our tribal members in our communities, no matter where they reside. So some of the four areas of our Native Vote campaign is get out the vote and voter registration, voter protection, um, and voter and candidate education and data collection. And those are the major elements of our Native Vote campaign. Um, and of course, the get out the vote and voter registration efforts are very grassroots oriented, and that's one of the reasons why we need you. We work with uh, you know a national network of tribally appointed coordinators to ensure that the information and resources we provide are shared effectively. And so we've asked every tribe to have a coordinator for their tribe um, to help coordinate within their tribe, and then we are um, our goal is to have a coordinator for every state. And we know some tribes are working in their regional tribal associations for coordination, and that works too. This, this is really important for us that we know that there's a mechanism for getting information out to you and to be able to provide resources and support to you um, as we can. So in light of that, one of the things that we've done this year is we've signed an MOU with um, Rock the Vote. And we've actually developed a native vote supplement to their Democracy Day curriculum, which they put in all the schools across the nation. And so in schools where there's a primarily high, you know, where there's a high population of native students, um, you know, this curriculum will be an addendum to what they are, um, uh, addendum to the, uh, the civic engagement curriculum that they do. And actually, if you would like to get a copy of that curriculum, you can go to nativevote.org, and it would be right there for you to use. I actually took that curriculum and passed it to every one of my tribal council members last week because I felt it was really important information. And not just our students should know it, all of our tribal members should know it. And so I'm urging tribal leaders to put that information into their newsletters and to share that information to help motivate our, our um our tribal members to get out the vote. So, and then of course our election protection efforts will um, focus primarily on the voter ID laws. Um, with all the states that are dealing with voter ID laws, um, it's important for us to be able to make sure that tribal IDs are protected as a um, as an identification for um, being able to go to the polls and to vote, and to be able to make sure that we also continue to. Um, have our poll watching and our other kinds of protection services in place for voter protection. And then, of course, on candidate education, both for voters and candidates, we want to ensure that our voters are really informed about the candidates running and important ballot measures. Um, and what we mean is we need each of our Native organizations, like the ones that you work for as you're working with this voter education, to think about the issues that affect your tribal members. So if you're in housing, for example, what is the information that our, um, particularly, how did their vote matter recently? What are the issues that, whether it be Congress or it be the, at the state level or at the county level or wherever, you know, what are those issues that drive, um, that are determined by how um, we turn out the vote and, and exercise our, um, our right to vote? And to be able to make sure that people understand that these decisions are made by policy leaders that we, we elect. And not to influence one way or another who they're voting for, but letting them be educated around the issues that how they vote will have an impact. And I think that's important. Um, and then, of course, we're supporting our Native candidates to run for whether it be state, federal, or local offices, because we know those ones who run for, for Local and, and state offices, you know, they're just on the pathway for running for a federal office, and that's going to be important to us to get more natives in elected positions. And of course, all of this comes down to we got to be able to measure success. And measuring success means that we need to have that very critically important piece of data. And so 
we are really working with, uh, wanting to work with our native voters to equip them with the right tools about how to get out to vote. And, and you know, we'll have future webinars. Peter will be talking about some of the voter data information that we're working with. We're looking at um, uh, getting some databases of state-to-state -state kind of um, data information, and we'll continue to share that information and how you can use that with your tribal membership data to be able to really identify um, um, who needs to get registered, um, where they're located, making sure their registrations are updated, et cetera. Because when it comes down to it, we have about over a million natives who are not eligible but not registered to vote. And given the size of our population in this nation, that's a significant number. About a third of our tribal members need to get, be, get registered and be out to vote. And that's why we're pushing for, this, for this, um, this webinar today, to see what you can do to be able to help us um, make these things happen. So as we go through the webinar, of course, we once again, I want to thank Isaiah Castilla for, um, for taking the time to be able to give this presentation. We did this last year. It was very successful. Um, and I really want you to think about the questions that you mean. Uh, what that you questions that you might have um, been asking yourself? What does it really mean to be a nonpartisan? How can we safely advocate for our issues? And how can we register voters and get out the vote? Um, and I'm hoping those questions will be answered. I'm, I'm sure those questions will be answered. And of course, you'll be able to ask additional questions at the end. Um, and if you have any more questions about our Native Vote campaign more broadly, please feel free to get a hold of Peter Morris, who um, opened the meeting here. His email is pmorris at ncai.org. But if you just go to NCAI's website, you can always contact us through the website. And the, and the emails will get connected to the right people, no matter what your question is. Um, and once again, I really want to thank you for taking the time today. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Isaiah to uh, move us on with the presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be on with you today. Uh, my name, again, is Isaiah Castilla. I work with Alliance for Justice as uh, an attorney here. Um, for those of you who don't know about Alliance for Justice, we are uh, the leading expert on, le on legal framework for nonprofit advocacy efforts. Um, we provide definitive information, resources, and technical assistance to encourage organizations, primarily uh, 501c3 organizations, to uh, help prepare you to be uh, advocates, to help you understand and navigate the waters of what can sometimes be a murky area of the law. Uh, we understand and know that uh, advocacy is, is not only so important, it's necessary. And many of your organizations, uh, and, and I've, it's been such a pleasure to work with NCAI, uh, AI, as well as uh, Native Vote, on this project, because so many of you know your com your community so well, know your constituencies, and a lot of times, uh, a lot of nonprofits have difficulty in in being as active as they need to be on issues that matter, because of uh, of what can be an area of the law that's very unclear. So what we do is try to help you help others and make that more clear and make the resources available to you so that you can um, make an impact in your communities. So we, again, we provide technical assistance, a number of resources on our website, afj.org. You can call our offices. Uh, I'll give you our numbers at the, the end of the presentation. You can call our office anytime um, from uh, 9 to 5, and we'll have uh, an attorney on call who can help kind of guide you through any questions you may have on elections or lobbying and advocacy, um, record keeping for lobbying, issues uh, like that, that that nonprofits typically face. So um, we'll, you know, get started. This is election rules for nonprofits. It, it is a very um, uh, important area of the law, especially this year. Um, as, as we spoke about before, or as uh, 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 Peter spoke about before, we do want to get um, as many people registered this year as possible. And I think it's a very noble and, and achievable goal to have the highest uh, native turnout um, um, 
uh, in history. So I think that's very possible and um, admire the work that you do. So what, the way we'll begin this, um, uh, this presentation and this training is the way we, we usually do, which is to compare nonprofit organizations. And um, it, I believe it's really important to always kind of lay a foundation uh, so that people understand and so that we understand there are different types of nonprofits, different types of tax exempt organizations with different types of rights and different types of uh, 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 things that they can and can't do. So we want to make sure that you understand um, what you can and can't do. Second, um, we want to discuss uh, nonpartisan. What does it mean to be nonpartisan? Lots of times, we hear people say and hear organizations say, um, you got to be nonpartisan. You're a nonprofit. What does that mean? What does nonpartisan mean? How far does it extend? And what's the definition? Third, we'll talk about safely advocating for our issues. How do we safely advocate? How are we, uh, during election, how can we still stay on the forefront of the issues that we care about and talk about those issues? and um, not be in violation of, um, of, of the law. Fourth, can we help register voters or help get out to vote? Of course we can. Of course we can. And that's what Native Vote is all about. But there's a way to go about doing it. We're going to talk about ways to do it and be effective. And educating voters about the issues. We can educate voters about issues that matter to us, that matter to our organizations. And we'll talk about uh, some ways in which um, we can do that. Finally, what more can we do? What can we do as nonprofits? What can we do in our individual capacity as um, um, people who work for nonprofits or are, are members of organizations that do um, work in our tax exempt? So again, this is a really um, interesting and important training for me. I was um, telling um, uh, uh, the staff before the call, before we started, that uh, I grew up in, in Mississippi, and my dad's first job before, uh, before I was actually born, but his first job out of college when he just got married to my mom was on the Choctaw Reservation in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi. And so my first year of life was spent uh, there on the reservation. Um, and my, my oldest brother spent quite a bit of time there. And as I grew up and, um, you know, we moved, and, and uh, but I got active in politics. Uh, uh, that's my, most of my background is kind of in, in political fundraising. It was very amazing to me and always impressive at the political uh, weight and power of the tribe. And so it's very important that we understand these rules and that we get people registered because of the power that those votes carry. And, uh, and, and that change. And that's the only way to bring about systemic change is activity um, through the vote. So first off, we'll again start with comparing nonprofits. And we'll just begin here with, um, with you know, 501c3 organizations. We hear many times people use the name interchangeably. Uh, you know, they say nonprofits to talk about every single tax exempt uh, organization. But they're not all the same. 501c3 organizations are the primary um, charitable organizations that we know about. These are organizations that are, are founded for religious, scientific, um, uh, uh, charitable um, purposes, educational purposes. These organizations are organizations like National Council of American Indians. Uh, it is uh, organizations like Alliance for Justice. These are tax-exempt um, nonprofit organizations. They don't pay federal income tax, but contributions to 501c3 organizations are tax deductible. Okay, so that's a very, very uh, important distinction and advantage for many of us, right, on this call. The way that we raise money is through uh, tax-exempt or tax-deductible, excuse me, contributions. And when you make your fundraising appeals you can always place on those uh, appeals uh, contributions to this organization of you know, 501c3 organization are tax deductible to the, to the full extent of the law. In addition, 
501c3 organizations are also the primary recipient of private foundation grants. This means the private foundations, which are also 501c3 organizations, but are different in uh, the way they're structured and the things they can do. Five on, uh, private foundations are more likely to make grants to 501c3 public charities. Private foundations are required by law to give away a certain amount of uh, money each year, and they choose to uh, give to um, 501c3s for uh, various reasons, primarily tax reasons. Um, and next, uh, lobbying activities. So now with the advantages of the fundraising for 501c3s, contributions are tax deductible, we get private foundation grants. Um, with that come some limitations. So we can't have everything, unfortunately. And uh, one of those limitations is on our lobbying. And we can talk more about that later. Uh, uh, if you have any questions on lobbying, we also offer trainings and, and technical assistance um, on lobbying. But uh, our lobbying activities are limited. Now remember, we can, as 501c3 public charities, can lobby. It's important uh, fact to, to point out. But again, with that lobbying comes some very generous restrictions. Okay, And finally, this is the big one for today at least. We want to remember this. We cannot, 501c3 public charities cannot support or oppose candidates for public office. Now we'll talk about more, talk more about what that means, what a public charity is, not public charity, excuse me, what a candidate for a public office is, um, and we'll deal with what we can do. I don't want to spend the whole time talking about what we can't do, but I do want to uh, get into what we can do and just make clear, if you don't remember anything else today, we could not support or oppose candidates for public office. 501c4 organizations in the next column are um, what, what are referred to as social welfare organizations. These uh, organizations are also tax exempt. Usually they are uh, focused around um, an, is an issue, in the, uh, issue based organizations. Um, these are organizations like the Sierra Club, they're organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, the Alliance for Justice Action Campaign, it is our affiliated C4. Or now, uh, 501C4s can do all the activities that a C3 can do and then some. 501c4 organizations can lobby to an unlimited extent. 501c4 organizations can support or oppose candidates as long as it is, as it is not the primary activity of the organization. Um, now, the reason why 501c4s can, you know, do more than we can as C3s is because while they are tax-exempt organizations, contributions to 501c4 organizations are not tax deductible. They are also not um, as likely to receive foundation grants. So 501c4s have um, a more difficult time, typically, sometimes, have a more difficult time raising money. They're usually these issue-based organizations and people who really, really care about issues support these organizations uh, so that they can carry out um, work that sometimes C3s cannot do that 501c3s can't carry out, and they can do more lobbying and, and stay on the forefront of, of certain issues. So uh, those, those are the major distinctions. 501c4s, 501c5s, which are labor unions, C501c6s, trade associations, all kind of fall under the same umbrella with the things they can do and with the fact that their contributions aren't tax deductible. Okay. Um, so, good thing to keep in mind as you embark on voter registration activities, sometimes uh, there are certain things that C4s can do to kind of take a little pressure off of you when we work in coalition. And so on certain, um, certain things that you might want to take on, certain activities that you may want to do, you might consider working in coalition with C4s and allow them to kind of take the burden off of, off of you as a C3 especially if it's an activity that uh, you may be a little um, um, worried about in terms of strategy. Uh, lastly, we'll just briefly touch on political organizations. These are 
um, organizations that are formed solely for supporting or opposing candidates. These are mainly uh, political action committees, uh, independent expenditure political action committees, or super PACs as they're called, independent political committees like Emily's, Emily's List, um, uh, or connected separate segregated funds like the LCD PAC. Their solely, solely, um, their sole purpose usually is to support or oppose candidates. That's it. Uh, rarely do they lobby. Um, they just, you know, only raise money to support or oppose candidates that support issues that they they support. So we we will go back again. No support or opposition for candidates running for public office. Most important thing we'll say today: possible penalties if we violate that prohibition. Um, and and. Penalties can be really, really extreme. Warning letter. We can receive warning letters from the IRS. Possibility of an excise tax uh, imposed on, on the organization. This is 501c3 organizations. Again, 501c3 organizations can receive an excise tax for violating this prohibition. Not only an excise tax on the organization, but also on the managers of that organization. And finally, the most extreme um, punishment can be uh, revocation of tax exempt status. Most of us know as 501c3 public charities, if we lose our tax exempt status, that is pretty much the end of, of, of our organization. Um, now, while this does not happen often, and many times, especially right now in the news, we hear a lot about uh, what's going on with nonprofit organizations and tax exempt organizations, some being accused of being involved in politics when they shouldn't be or in ways that they shouldn't be. Um, sometimes nothing happens. And sometimes it takes a long time for the IRS to get around to certain things. But there are cases in which these things do happen. And additionally, even if the penalty doesn't happen, even if the most extreme of these penalties never comes upon an organization that violates the prohibition to support or oppose candidates or not to support or oppose candidates. The most difficult thing can be dealing with complaints, dealing with someone filing a complaint against your organization saying that you're doing something that is, is illegal or, or is, is a violation of the law, of the law, and this uh, these complaints in that process can cost money and cost the organization precious time and take away from the issues that you really care about and that you really want to, to perform. So it's important to know the law um, and, and know what we can and can't do so that, so that we can keep our organization healthy and strong. So who is a candidate for public office? And this is where it gets, where we start to get into the interesting stuff. The IRS um, has a very broad definition of candidate. The IRS, of course, we know as we see on the screen, we know Mitt Romney is a candidate for office. He's declared that he's running for office. He's running a very public campaign, um, and, and some say is on track to uh, get his party's nomination. So we know that's a candidate for office. We know that the president is is running for re-election right now. He is embarked on a campaign, his campaign has started, and so forth. So those are pretty easy calls, right? We can pretty uh, um, easily call them candidates. But the IRS goes even further. The IRS says that even someone where there is discussion, any discussion around somebody being a candidate for office, puts that person into the candidate category. And we want to start to think of things in that manner. So any efforts to draft a person for office, like you see here with Facebook, Hillary Clinton 2012, people are trying to or are trying to draft her for office or to run for office, uh, supporting or opposing that effort or dra that draft effort, the IRS would be consider that person a candidate. They consider her a candidate, and it would be improper for a 501c3 organization to get involved in a draft this person for office effort. 
okay, because that person is, although they may not be a candidate currently, the IRS says, yeah, they are. So keep that in mind. And uh, characteristics of the definition of candidate, this is for public office, everything from um, uh, President of the United States to uh, Sheriff. It's an office created by statute uh, in, federal, in, in whatever state law or, or, or federal law. Um, it's an ongoing position with a fixed term that requires an oath of office. This even includes school boards. Some people ask me the question often, um, what if this person is running as nonpartisan? They're not running um, with any party. The IRS says, yeah, that person is still considered a candidate. Okay, so let's keep those things in mind. The candidate definition is very broad. So we spent some time to defining candidate. Uh, as I said before, I don't want to spend too much time talking about what we can't do. Someone put it to me once. They said, uh, you know, don't. Uh, don't keep showing me the trees. Teach me how to ski, right? So I want to teach you how to ski today. What are the things we can do? Issue advocacy, voter registration, voter education, and we can even do a little bit more than that. So the, you're not expected during an election when you know things get going to just completely go mute and not speak up or speak out, but there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. We'll talk about that. What is nonpartisan? What's that mean? So the IRS uses what's referred to as a facts and circumstances test. Okay, when the IRS is working to determine or is trying to figure out whether an organization has engaged in improper electoral activity. They use what's referred to as the facts and circumstances test. And this facts and circumstances test is basically a smell test. It's, it's a test where they look at a number of different factors, factors like proximity to the election, what's included in an advertisement or in a, a handout, what, are, what is the organization saying, does the organization have a history of speaking out on certain issues, um, and how, does that, how is that speaking out coincide with the election. So it's a very, you know, unclear test, but it's basically a smell test. It's kind of like a gut check. If you feel like you're doing something that's out of order, you might be doing that. You just you want to look at your reasoning for why you're doing what you're doing. If it's to encourage people to get out the vote, if it's to encourage people to participate in the in sit in their um, demo, in the democratic process, Democrat with a small D, Democratic. If they if you're encouraging people to in, uh, engage in that process, that's okay. That's just encouraging people to take part and let their voice be heard. Um, if if you're doing it to tell people or you're engaging in activity to tell people how to vote or which way to vote, that's something, which party to support, that's something that is uh, 501c3s we really can't do. Okay, So let's keep those things in mind. So let's take, what we're going to do is just kind of start with, um, just to kind of demonstrate that facts and circumstances test, we'll start with just kind of a little, uh, 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 just example uh, to begin. So it, as you read on the screen, read along with me, um, uh, this facts and circumstances test says, this ad says, who's for kids and who's just kidding? 85% of American voters agree that our political leaders are not doing enough to help solve the problems facing children today. A child can't see through uh, campaign promises, but you can. If government is not about children, then what is it worth? Make your vote count for kids. Now, we'll use kind of the uh, traffic light model, red for stop, green for go, for go, yellow for slow down. So how many people, well, I, this is how I usually do it in most of my trainings, I ask, kind of ask a question, but I can't necessarily see your hands today, so I'll just kind of ask it rhetorically. Uh, some people think, or who, who, who would think this would be um, a good ad or, or, or an acceptable ad? for a 501c3 organization to run in an election year, or to run, period, not even in an election year, just to run this simple issue ad 
who's for kids and who's just kidding. I would argue that yeah, this is this is okay. Make your vote for, count for kids. If a 501c3 organization is running this uh, this this advertisement, this issue advertisement, and it's just saying who's for kids and who's just kidding. This is an issue that they care about, and they're just running this ad to tell people to vote. Make your vote count for kids. That's I would argue that's acceptable. That's okay. All right, just simple. But let's let's complicate things a little bit, and this is what we deal with most of the time. We deal with complicated, or most of your your organizations or whoever uh, you you're working with. Most times we'll come up against a, a little this this kind of murky area. So this is the, the the part where it gets tough. Let's add facts and circumstances now. Let's say, for instance, instead of the organization just running this ad whenever, let's say we, we, we run this um, advertisement uh, about a, a month out from an election. And let's say there are two candidates in a uh, presidential election, and we've got one candidate who's saying, huh, who's for kids and who's just kidding? This candidate, uh, his whole platform um, is built around kids. The kids are our future, is what he says. We have to fight for children. Um, you know, I want more playgrounds and after-school programs and, uh, and and better education because kids are our future. And the whole platform of this candidate is built around kids. And let's say we have another candidate who says, that she says, um, you know, kids are important. I have kids. I love kids. Like kids. I was a kid. But you know what? It's not all about kids. It's about jobs. And my opponent is just kidding around if they think that this is all about kids. This is about jobs. Okay. Now, let's take that, that, that scenario. Those are the facts and circumstances. And then we run this ad as a 501c3. Then I would give it a, a red. I would say this is something that a 501c3 public charity needs to be careful about because of those facts and circumstances it appears that this organization is running this advertisement in order to make an impact in the election and to sway voters to get voters to vote for a certain candidate that candidate being the kids candidate so that's where we run into problems when it could be interpreted that the organization is running this ad with the sole purpose, the sole purpose of intervening in the election and um, telling voters how to vote. That's where what we have to think about. Our responsibility as 501c3 organizations is not to tell people how to vote or, or who to vote for. Our organizations are supposed to inform people of issues and just to, and to help them participate in the process, and that we trust that they will make the right decision for themselves and their communities. Now let's take one more scenario and add some more facts and circumstances. Let's finally say that we have an organization that runs this advertisement, and um, they run it, and they run it all over the country. They run it, you know, in states with elections, they run it in states without elections. Let's say they've run this ad for 20 years, right? It's part of an ongoing series, something they do all for 20 years. They've been running who's for kids and who's just kidding in every state, right? And not only do they do that, uh, they vary it up from time to time. They say who's for the environment, who's just kidding, who's for, uh, for, uh, 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 who's for education, and who's just kidding. Now, in that situation, then I would give it a yellow. I think a good argument can be made, and I think the organization can make a great argument and say that, hey, you know, there may have had, there may a few states or districts may happen to have um, elections going on, but we've run this ad for 20 years. As I said before, one of those factors is part of an ongoing series. This is part of an ongoing series. It's happened for years. Uh, we always run this ad, uh, and not only that, we run it in every state. We're not targeting an election. We're not trying to influence the election. We're not trying to tell voters 
who to vote for because frankly we don't know we just run this advertisement every year to remind people um, about the issue in that situation I would give it a yellow but I, w I would you know be cautious and, and maybe you know consider strategy but uh, I, I think a good argument can be made um, uh, made in favor of the organization in that situation so now that we've talked about that facts and circumstances test, I hope it was, it, 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 like I said, it can be a, a, a difficult area uh, of the law, kind of a murky area. But as we continue, as we go throughout this training, those things will reoccur and occur. And I'm going to kind of try to drill it, make sure we drill it into our minds that we make sure we can, you know, when we see a problem, we can focus on the problem and hopefully fix it before things go bad. So issue advocacy, advocating for organizations' issues in an election year. This is something a lot of organizations call us about. Um, can we, you know, speak out? We heard a candidate say something that we didn't agree with, and we want to say something uh, about the issue. They say something about an issue that we really care about. For instance, uh, you know, it may be um, immigration, or it may be uh, the. I, I've seen that the. For instance, the uh, NCAI is very active on the Violence Against Women Act. And, you know, say, for instance, your organization wants to make a statement about that, a candidate has said something about, um, about that issue, well, that you may not agree with. Well, we can still speak. We can still um, speak out. Remember, we just have to be careful about how we do it. We look at whether the statement identifies one, one or more candidates for office. In your statement, you want to make sure that you don't um, focus on a candidate or that candidate's um, uh, fitness for office. You don't just want to discuss um, or approve a candidate's position or, his, or their actions. You want to be, not just ramp up your criticism close to the election, but that this needs to be an issue that your organization hopefully has been working on. And if it's not, don't make that statement about the candidate, but about the issue. We care about issues. So you can continue your lobbying campaigns, your advocacy campaigns. Um, we can continue to be outspoken on those issues that matter to our organizations. But during, uh, you want to be sure not to uh, to criticize based on the fitness for office. As we see here, uh, we can criticize incumbents. Again, we can criticize incumbents, but we don't want to ramp up our criticism um, just because this person happens to be a candidate, but because of uh, the issue. And we speak out on issues. So as you see here, focus on, legisl on legislative issues. We you can continue your lobbying efforts, your advocacy efforts, um, but you want to make that part of an ongoing criticism. And you cannot and should not um, criticize a person's per personal characteristics or fitness for office. And remember, we're speaking mainly about 501c3 public charities. As we said before, 501c4s can do a little bit more. They have um, uh, the the ability to speak um, about a candidate's uh, fitness for office because they can, can can support or oppose candidates. But um, we we want to make sure that we understand that distinction. Um, legislative scorecards is one way to um, prop up legislators who have supported your priorities in the past, who have been um, active um, in the legislative process. And uh, this is a good way to focus on those candidates who have been champions of your issue. And the, the primary way to use legislative scorecards as a 501c3 is um, as a way not only to point out champions on your issues, but to, uh, at, towards the end of a, le a, lo a legislative session, to increase your lobbying efforts. This helps to um, know what, what, what legislators that you need to focus on and um, um, what areas you should focus on when you engage in lobbying efforts. And um, one thing to point out is that the, the IRS um, has, has offered us two safe harbors for legislative scorecards. 
So for 501c3, there are two what we call safe harbors for uh, for those legislative scorecards. And the reason why we offer those is because there there is the fear uh, of, of 501c3s using the legislative scorecard to show uh, as a way to show people who um, uh, voters should vote for, and that's not or should not be the purpose of that. So there are two safe harbors. So when doing a legislative scorecard, if it fits into your legislative strategy as an organization or your advocacy strategy, you you have two ways to do that. First, you want to make sure that you send um, that you send the legislative scorecard to the public. Now, if this is a public legislative scorecard, it goes out to uh, to the public. Then you want to publish it regularly. You want to make sure that the scorecard includes all legislators. And um, by that I mean a, you can't exclude certain legislators of certain parties or certain legislators that you think may be um, more sympathetic to uh, your issues than another legislator. You want to include them all, even those who are retiring in this legislative scorecard. If it's sent to the public, again, you want to make sure this legislative scorecard covers a broad range of issues. So as many issues as you can include, um, in that scorecard, you want to include those. And finally, it needs to avoid commentary. You can't comment on the votes taken. You can't comment on who's good on a certain issue and who's not. When it's disseminated to the public, your legislative scorecard um, needs to be put together with the sole purpose of informing people about issues and, um, and hopefully um, finding those people who are champions on the issues that you care about. People you can go back to in the next legislative session, and frankly, those legislators that you need to work on for your next uh, uh, lobbying effort. And so that's the first safe harbor. The second um, safe harbor that the IRS uh, offers to us is when we send or disseminate um, a legislative scorecard to our members, membership organizations. So if you disseminate a scorecard to your members, you can publish it. You have to publish it regularly. Traditionally, you want to do it towards the end of a legislative session. You want to include all legislators in that scorecard. But in a, a scorecard disseminated to your members, you can, um, you, need, you can cover a narrow range of issues. So you can just find a few issues that you care about and just cover those and you can also make commentary on the scorecard. So there's a little more um, leeway if it's just going to members and members only. Okay. So as I said before, a great way to show who is who are uh, who what people are champions on your issues. Now if your organization chooses not to use either one of those safe harbors, then you have to, uh, you will be judged on the facts and circumstances test. And the IRS will, again, look at those number of factors that we kind of talked about to determine if it's in, indeed in violation of, um, of the prohibition to support or oppose candidates for office. And this, that prohibition, again, extends from federal office to state office to local office. Um, and so this would be an improper uh, card for C3. This is, of course, a candidate comparison, and it's one party, and it shows, uh, it, of course, doesn't include all legislators. And it, it intended to show or to influence how uh, people who support the human rights campaign vote. And that would be something that you don't want to do. You're not trying to influence uh, voters and how they vote. or who they vote for. OK, so candidate education is uh, an area that we also uh, get uh, tons of uh, inquiries on. People want to know, how can we um, keep our issue in um, as a part of the public dialogue? during an election. It's a great time during elections to an election season to keep your issue on the forefront and keep it in, um, um, frankly, in the news and, um, and, and to keep candidates talking about those issues that you care about. Great way to keep your constituency informed on what's going on. 
And one way that we can educate candidates as 501c3 organizations and members who are people who work with 501c3 organizations, one thing we can do is to educate candidates. And there are a few ways we can do that, or there's a, one of the main ways we can do that is, uh, you know, of course, through a briefing book or some kind of perhaps, you know, pamphlet that you may have put together. It doesn't, I don't think, necessarily have to be a, a briefing book. But what's important is uh, are a couple of things. As far as distribution, you want to make sure that when you educate candidates, if you want to educate them about, uh, for instance, the importance of the native vote, the important, uh, the importance of um, um, uh, of protecting native women, um, as it relates to the Violence Against Women Act, you want to make sure that you offer. For instance, if it's a briefing book like the one on your screen, it has to be offered to to every candidate. Um, and you want to use information that you've already put together, that you've already found, already a part of research that you do in the course of uh, your organization's work, and only create new or, uh, information if you, ha if you have a reason to. Um, you don't want to create information at the request of a candidate. That's something that you really want to be careful about. If we create information at the request of a candidate, it could be uh, regarded as or will be regarded as conferring a benefit on the campaign, which is something we cannot do in, in contributing to a candidate's campaign. So if you create something, if you want to educate the candidates, offer it to every candidate and use that information that you've already put together. Um, so now we're getting to uh, voter registration. We can register voters. Very important. Uh, part of being a 501c3 public charity is reaching out to our constituents, reaching out, um, encouraging uh, people to participate in the democratic process, and uh, you know to encourage civic engagement, which is um, what Native Vote is all about. So how do we do that? How do we engage in voter registration? First off, this is what you can't do. Okay, you can't reference party or candidate in your registration efforts. You cannot, um, uh, like it's on the screen here, for instance, if you're having a, um, uh, you know, uh, if there's some kind of festival and you may, you know, or, or 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 some event and you may be uh, registering voters at that event and see it as an opportunity to get voters, uh, and that's that's you know something that you can do. But one thing you can't do is you don't want to show or make reference to a party or a candidate in uh, that registration effort. Additionally, you don't want to um, suggest who to vote for. So you wouldn't show up to your registration day with uh, a, a, an Obama for America t-shirt on or a Romney, Romney uh, uh, t-shirt on. That would uh, you know, imply the people that you were asking them to vote for a certain candidate. That would be um, improper. Additionally, you want to make sure that you make your service, your voter registration, available to everyone. We cannot exclude um, individuals based on the parties that they, uh, you know, we may know, and many times in the, com in, in the communities that we work with, we're very well known in those communities, and we know other people. Everybody knows everybody. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we may know a person's political uh, persuasion, or we may think we know that. You can't exclude them if they want to register to vote. We can't exclude others who who want to register to vote. And finally, we want to target our voters and target those who uh, who who want to vote on nonpartisan reasons. You can't target based on swing districts. You couldn't say, okay, we want to register voters, and we're going to go to District 20 because we know we've got plenty of voters there who are going to vote you know, X party or Y party. We want to target for nonpartisan uh, reasons. But it's important to point out that we can target um, based on uh, uh, location, in terms of proximity, say for instance, there is uh, you, you're just going to go to um, the neighborhoods that are close to your house or close to the office. 
that are within 30 miles of the office. That's okay, okay? Just say it, it's within a certain proximity of the office. And it's especially good if you can document that reason or you can articulate it in, in a written form. Also, we can target based on um, those uh, on historically underrepresented groups in voting. So that would be African Americans, Native Americans, um, um, Asian Americans, uh, groups that are um, uh, um, uh, um, Hispanic Americans, those who are typically not um, uh, engaged in uh, the voting process over historic, uh, historically um, statistics. You know, statistics show that these groups uh, have not turned out to vote in the numbers as others. The historically underrepresented groups can we can target based on those uh, on that um, uh, characteristic as well, and that includes young people. Uh, so if you want to go to college campuses to uh, register voters, which is a big part of what Rock the Vote does, and also um, and I know Native Vote is working with Rock the Vote. That's also um, an articulable reason that we can. Uh, work to register voters with. So how many people think this would be an okay um, voter registration uh, campaign or ad? Native pride, native power, native vote, your voice counts. Native vote 2010. I'd say, yeah, I'd give it a green. Um, again, we can focus based on historically underrepresented groups. And this is just encouraging people to participate in the process. It's not telling people how to vote. We're not saying vote this party, vote that party, vote this candidate, vote that candidate. It's strictly saying your voice counts. Civic engagement is important. And unless you put that power to work and to use, uh, your voice won't be heard. So very good ad. And uh, it's something we can, we, that's a go. It's a green. So we'll go through a couple of examples of some other voting campaign uh, materials that I think are important uh, to show. So vote pro-choice. I'm going to give that one a red. The IRS has specifically pointed out certain words that they regard as code words or words that are uh, 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 words that have become so associated with a specific party or a specific ideology that those words are instantly, instantly connected to a certain party or a certain type of um, ideal. So saying vote pro-choice, vote pro-life, vote conservative, vote liberal, those are what the IRS considers to be um, uh, um, um, code words and words that are telling people or trying to direct people to vote to uh, a certain party. So keep that in mind. We want to avoid uh, using those code words. We want to avoid trying to tell people or uh, implicitly telling people how to vote, like wink, wink, nod, nod, vote this way. Can't do that. Vote the environment. I give vote the environment a yellow, right? There's a time when vote the environment um, honestly uh, could have been considered or probably would have been considered to be uh, associated with the left. But now, um, well, you know, there are some people who uh, may not be concerned with the environment. But there are some organizations and some efforts both to conserve land and to uh, vote in, in terms of you know, frack, there's some issues in hydro fracking, all those type of things, they are kind of falling into a bipartisan category. And again, you got to look at the facts and circumstances. I had uh, an organization call once that wanted to run a campaign similar to Vote the Environment. Um, and, you know, at first, again, it was something that I say, hey, be cautious about, but uh, could be, you know, kind of fall both ways. Upon far further research, however, I found out that they were there were several excuse me there were several elections going on in uh, a certain state um, and in certain districts where this organization was working their voter registration campaign that were um, a few of these elections had some really contentious environmental um, issues 
related to um, um, to what they were embarking on or to what was going on in the election. And so in that instance, I would give that a red. I would say you need to be careful about it because if you're intervening in the middle of an election saying vote the environment and the environment is a critical, pivotal issue in that election, the IRS could, you know, when making that facts and circumstances test and determination, could determine or maybe would determine that um, you were indeed trying to tell people who to vote for. So be careful. Depends on the facts and circumstances, but generally, give it a yellow. Finally, vote is easy. It's just simply telling people where to go to vote, how to vote, not who to vote for, no issue, strictly encouraging participation in the democratic process. Um, next, voter education. How can we educate voters in a nonpartisan way about the candidates um, that are out there? Really important um, thing. We want to encourage people to not only participate in the process, but also to inform them about who's out there. So some organizations want to do this uh, through candidate questionnaires or uh, uh, want to give uh, send questionnaires to candidates for the candidate to, or for the organization to publish in what's referred to as a voter guide, or you know, shows you a candidate um, comparison and those responses to the questions that have been uh, sent to the questionnaires. So, if for a 501c3 public charity, there are a few things that you would need to do in order to do a candidate questionnaire. First. You want to make sure that you have unbiased, open-ended questions in your questionnaire. The questions cannot, um, you know, be a leading question, leading a candidate towards the answer. Can't say we support, you know, uh, we support uh, such and such rule, or we support uh, the Violence Against Women Act. How would you vote on the Violence Against Women Act? Um, that would be improper for a 501c3 organization. A 501c3, uh, again, in my previous previous example, would not want uh, or could not ask a candidate to take a pledge. Take this pledge that you will assign the Violence Against Women Act. That would be improper for a 501c3. Um, additionally, you want the questionnaire to cover a broad range of issues. And again, this is one of those areas that we kind of discussed earlier. Uh, when we were going through the various um, nonprofit organizations, political organizations, 501c4 organizations, 501c5 public uh, or uh, trade unions, excuse me, these organizations can do more, right? So many times we work in coalition to get some of these things done that we can't necessarily do, or or we let the 501c4 handle some of the more contentious activity. In addition, if you want to cover a broad range of issues, sometimes it helps to work with other 501c3s, maybe a healthcare organization, maybe um, maybe uh, a, a, an environmental organization, different things. And then in the context of um, uh, work that has to do with the tribes uh, or, or uh, native, uh, native issues, Native American issues, um, I could argue, or I think a good argument can be made, that when you do a questionnaire, you can cover a wide range of issues that affect um, Native Americans, that will affect uh, your tribes and the things that, and you can cover issues like education, issues like um, um, the environment, issues, all of these issues can be covered, um, I think. But you want to make sure that it's a broad range of issues. You can't ask candidates to take pledges. Uh, and when you format it, you want to make sure that there is no editing, right? You cannot edit the candidates' responses to those questions. So what a lot of um, organizations do is give the candidate a word limit on their um, questionnaire. So as soon as the uh, as soon as um, the response is done, as soon as the candidate has finished the response, you publish that response equally. So one candidate candidate gets 50 words, the other gets 50 words, and it doesn't appear that one candidate has more of a say than another, right? So it's an equal response. Um, you can't edit it, edit 
the candidate's responses, even if there are mistakes in it, you have to present it as they gave it to you. And finally, we want to look at disclaimers, like the one on your screen. Maybe as a backstop, a way to protect yourself. Neither the League of Women Voters Education Fund nor any of its partners takes any position on or expresses any preference about the issues or candidates displayed on this site. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Debates and forums, another way to educate, uh, to educate the public about candidates. So on um, the issue of debates and forums, excuse me, oh, you want to make sure that um, um, my throat is a little parched. I'm going to take a, a sip of water. Oh. OK, ready. Um, so on the issue of um, debates and forums, um, this is another thing that many 501c3 organizations and those of us who are affiliated with um, uh, public charities, we want to do debates to educate the public about the candidates. And that's okay. Uh, we can do that, but we need to make sure, again, kind of those same rules that we just covered with the questionnaires, cover uh, a broad range of issues. This is another area where it's helpful to, again, work in coalition with other organizations that can perhaps help us structure those broad range of issues. And uh, also have unbiased questions. Again, you can't tell uh, the candidate how you want a question answered. Allow the candidate to speak and allow the people to make their own judgment about that person's answer. Again, uh, the format has to be to invite all viable candidates. Again, it's kind of that same thing we, we see before. It's all about equality. I'm giving you a chance. You give every viable candidate a shot to attend um, the debate, have fair rules, an impartial moderator, someone who doesn't have a stake in the fight, um, you know, someone who is uh, simply there to moderate the debate and not to direct the debate to uh, uh, look favorable towards one candidate, not another. You want the the audience to be unbiased. So, in other words, don't try to stack the deck against another candidate. You don't want. It's like you know you wouldn't want to put all your friends who you know may be associated with one party all into the the uh, the debate. You want to make sure that you offer it and open it up to everyone, and that equal opportunity is given, and you don't favor one candidate of, or over the other. So those are your rules as far as debates um, and, and forums. Um, on the issue of candidate appearances, you know, there are times when uh, we may want a candidate to appear. Um, and, and, and instead of a debate, we want the candidates to perhaps just speak to our constituency. And so that the uh, so that our constituents and our affiliates can then make their own judgment uh, about the candidate, and the candidate can have a chance to talk. Again, some of those same rules we just talked about apply. You want to give equal equal opportunity to both to every candidate. Every viable candidate gets a chance to come and gets a chance to speak. You don't want to, again, contextually favor one candidate over the other. And that means simply that, you know, I couldn't invite or shouldn't invite, uh, you know, one candidate to attend an event where we may have or we know a thousand people will turn out and then invite the other to one where there's, you know, maybe two or three people. Um, you also don't want to contextually favor the person because, you know, you may have two or three people who are, you know, extremely um, powerful people that you put this person in a room with, um, and and that would be improper as well. So you want to make sure that you don't favor one person o over the other if you have candidates come to speak in their capacity as a candidate, not as a per not as just you know showing up to speak, but they're in their capacity as a candidate. No contextual favoritism. Give the opportunity to each candidate and invite all the uh, viable candidates. Now, there are other situations where we uh, want candidates to appear not in their um, position as a candidate, 
uh, but you know, in their position as uh, a contributor to society. And this happens sometimes when we have candidates who have, for instance, written books, or uh, who has um, who we may want to thank uh, for for their stance on certain issues. Okay, so in, in that situation, when you have an appearance that's not related to the candidacy, it's related. For instance, this example on the screen is uh, the current um, Attorney General for California. When she was running for office, she had a book out called Smart on Crime. And uh, so she had this book out, and um, it, a nonprofit that may be working on crime prevention or issues of that nature may want to have her come in and speak about her book, talk about her book. That's OK. You can definitely do that. But you have to be clear that this is not about your candidacy. It's important to make that clear to the candidate before they come. As someone who's worked on these campaigns, we would show up to, uh, you know, as a campaign staffer, you show up to a nonprofit, and your uh, uh, candidate is there to speak uh, not in their uh, candidacy or not as a candidate. They're there to speak about a book or educational um, endeavor. You cannot, or it would be improper for us to go around, um, you know, handing out paraphernalia that has to do with the candidacy. So you want to be clear to the candidate because they don't know the rules, and frankly, sometimes they don't care to know the rules because uh, all they care about is winning and votes. So you want to be clear to the candidate before they show up, hey, look, this is a 501c3 public charity. We we work with a 501c3 public charity. And we are having you appear not as a candidate, but um, up to see, we're having you speak about your book. We'd like to hear what you have to say about smart on crime, for example. And this is an issue we care about. Here is a disclaimer. So send the candidate a letter so that you've got it on paper and ask them not to mention a candidacy. Additionally, again, that contextual favoritism. You don't want to have this really close to the election. You don't want to wait till, you know, right before the election to have them come speak. You know, it, it, then it just looks bad. It just looks like uh, you are timing it to coincide with the election. Again, this would this would uh, be the same um, uh, requirement would extend to uh, uh, appearances that have to do with uh, awards. So organizations oftentimes want to um, award people who have been champions on their issues. Like this, um, the slide in front of you has uh, March 6, 2012. It's the NTLR Capital Awards. And they wanted to make sure that they rewarded those people who were champions on issues and Hispanic leaders and government officials, people who were champions on legislation and public policy that benefit Hispanic Americans. So it wasn't about someone who may happen to be a candidate or may be a candidate for office. It's about the issue. And um, as you see and you read down in the second paragraph, uh, they had a Democratic legislator and a Republican, um, a Republican mayor that they gave uh, an award to which was uh, a, a good way to balance. And additionally, they didn't, didn't, um, didn't have the award ceremony, or you don't want to have it uh, when there's an election looming. You don't want to have it too close to the election. So again, those, we've got our rules in front of us. Take uh, uh, candidate related. If you're having them appear, having a candidate appear um, to speak about their candidacy, you want to make sure you provide an equal opportunity to every candidate, every viable candidate. You cannot contextually favor one candidate over the other. Um, you can time it to coincide with the election, because naturally you are trying to help inform voters about the candidates that are run. And uh, on the and the candidates, again, can discuss the election. If it's not related to the candidacy, just flip everything. We just do everything in the reverse. You don't have to provide equal opportunity. Um, you also cannot contextually favor somebody because they're a candidate that has nothing to do with their candidacy. It's an educational experience, an opportunity, um, and every candidate's not 
required to attend. And finally, don't time it to coincide with the election. And oftentimes, again, disclaimers help uh, or a letter to the campaign, to the organization uh, is always helpful. Uh, let's see. Uh, doing more is important as well. Uh, you, can, you don't lose your rights as an individual simply because you work for a nonprofit or maybe associated with a 501c3 organization. You can still do things in your individual capacity. Um, and, and, you know, we can, of course, still vote, still support candidates in your individual capacity, in your personal time. You can definitely still uh, volunteer with campaigns or contribute to campaigns. But a clear line has to be drawn. Um, you don't want to use uh, 501c3 resources. The resources of uh, a 501c3 public charity to further the campaign of, uh, of some candidate. Um, again, it needs to be in your personal capacity. And on company time, for instance, you wouldn't want to send emails fundraising for a candidate. You wouldn't want to send emails um, uh, trying to seek votes for a candidate at your desk and in, in your office. You don't want to have, you know, posters of candidates for uh, for president or for mayor or for senate or, or whatever in your office as a 501c3 organization. Uh, anything that in you know is campaign related that's propping up the campaign of a candidate. Um, but again, in your in your uh, personal time, you can do whatever you'd like, and it's important as 501c3 public charities that we have a policy. It helps. It helps and it protects us to have a policy for employees as it's related to uh, campaign related activity while they're in the office. And so a policy always helps. Uh, always helps out. Finally, uh, or next, um, we can uh, participate in post-election activities. So once a uh, candidate, for instance, wins uh, an election, once the election is over, we can encourage or we can thank that candidate. We can congratulate that candidate. We can say, let's keep the work going. Uh, congratulations for winning. Um, and then you can work to perhaps get people appointed to the transition team or uh, get people appointed to, to certain offices. In certain instances, that that may be considered lobbying, but that's something we can talk about later. Um, but um, we can definitely do that. We can definitely congratulate um, um, uh, 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 elected officials once they're elected. In your business dealings, if you've got an office that you make available for rent, often we do it here at Alliance for Justice. Some organizations use our conference room. Well, you want to make sure that you make that service available to every candidate. We have oftentimes questions about, you know, if somebody wants a candidate X wants to come use our office to our uh, uh, wants to use our conference room for a meeting. Can we do that? Well, as long as you make it available to every uh, candidate, uh, not only make it available to every candidate, you have to make sure that uh, that it's, it's it, that you charge fair market value and charge a, a fee, and it needs to be something that you that your organization does on the regular. You don't want to make that opportunity available specifically for a certain candidate or a certain um, a, a certain party. Um, and this extends not only to conference rooms, but this, you know, list. Oftentimes, candidates and people they want our um, they want our, our list. They want to get a hold of your email list and mailing list and phone list. Those things they have to pay for, and you have to make it available to each candidate. Everybody has to have the opportunity. So, if candidate X from X party calls and says, "Hey, look, I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see your." Um, your, uh, I'd like to buy your list from you. I'd like to rent your list from you, your email list. And then candidate Y calls. You have to give it to candidate Y for the same price. Okay. And finally, social networking. We actually have a publication on our website, www.afj.com. 
afj.org, afj.org, um, that deals with social networking, deals with uh, public policy in the digital age. It's our most downloaded publication. You can download it for free. Really good publication that explains the rules of social networking as it pertains to 501c3 public charities, what they can and can't do um, with social networking, uh, what you should be careful about, all those issues. The IRS has not, as you can imagine, probably they have not issued a, a lot of guidance. They're not really on the cutting edge when it comes to technology. But it's important to just remember the same rules we've been talking about today apply to social networking. Uh, you, you cannot support or oppose a candidate on a Facebook page or on your Twitter feed for a C3 public charity. Uh, and, and that's something you want to make sure you make clear to staff is that we cannot support or oppose a candidate or a party on those um, social networking sites. Uh, for user comments, when people uh, make comments, you need to have a policy. So on your Facebook page, for instance, if someone is posting, uh, someone who may have friended you or on Facebook, you know, gets on your comments page and, and starts to, to rail on candidates and, and you need to have a policy. Either you take it down or if you leave it up you need to have a disclaimer that you automatically post and say we don't support or post candidates for office or uh, if you leave them every candidate, every comment up you have to leave every comment up and it's you know you need to make sure that you've established a pattern and that you've got uh, a policy. I would suggest um, I would suggest making sure that if you delete those comments, you delete every um, comment that supports or opposes a candidate, and you need to make sure that you or, or that you have a disclaimer. If you leave up comments, have a disclaimer. Those are just good policies. Um, and again, the rules for friending or liking politicians um, are, are, are interesting. If on Facebook, for example, you can friend and official page. So there's a difference between President Obama's official White House page, which you can follow for updates, and then friending his campaign page. You would want to be clear and 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 uh, be careful about doing that. Um, and, and the IRS would regard, uh, while they don't have specific rules um, on that, the IRS does regard friending campaign pages for 501c3s to be showing that you like that person. Kind of difficult rule, but um, as far as Twitter is concerned, it's a totally different um, rule. For Twitter, the IRS does allow us to follow uh, politicians or follow, uh, not just politicians, but to follow uh, campaign pages important to make this distinction. Facebook, we can um, we can friend official pages, the official page for the office of this representative or senator, their official page, we can we can friend or like. But we can't friend or like their campaign page. As far as Twitter goes, on the other hand, we can follow on Twitter. Now, I know that seems like kind of, you know, um, like a, a rule that doesn't make much sense, but that's the, the, the IRS rule. Twitter, you can do it. Facebook, be careful. Okay? So, um, now that we've talked about friends and liking friends and all of that, let's, uh, let's, let's take questions. So, I So at this point, uh, thanks, Isaiah. At this point, if anyone has questions, you can indicate it using the uh, the webinar system, and we'd love to hear any questions you have at this point. Michael's going to give you the technical details of asking a question. Great. So to uh, to ask a question in the webinar, you can click on the uh, raise your hand button. Um, which is in the GoToWebinar um, uh, control uh, options. 
Um, you can also type your question into the question panel, uh, which is also on the GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, we'll answer those. Um, it looks like we have a question from Joy Huntington. Uh, Joy, we're going to unmute your line, and then you can ask your question. Joy? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Joy. Hi, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. And um, my question relates to the previous discussion um, we just heard about liking and friending on Facebook. Um, I will be, you know, coordinating a lot of the get out the native vote activities here in Fairbanks for our region. However, you know, I consider my Facebook page separate from that. So mm -hmm. if I go and I like a candidate. Um, you know, would that be considered? Because it isn't at all an official site for our organization, um, and I'm a mm -hmm. private contractor as well. So, um, can you speak to that a little bit? And also, I was recently asked to um, possibly give an, a welcoming address at the uh, Democratic um, State Convention here in Fairbanks in a couple of weeks. But again, you know, I mean, I would be, I mean, that would be during my own time, but it's kind of drawing some some tricky lines there. So could you please speak to both of those questions? Sure, sure, definitely. So um, I'll start with your question about Facebook. Again, um, in your private uh, life, in private capacity, you know, you can do whatever you'd like. Uh, you can support candidates and, and encourage people to vote for a candidate in your private position. The difficulty comes when we lead organizations, and um, our organization and our life is so intertwined that people view us as someone who's who's linked so closely with our organization that the things we do on our page reflect onto our organization. Do you, you, you understand what I'm saying? I, it, you just have to. It's um, so so. I would say, um, you know, you can definitely, you know, on your page, on your Facebook page, do it, what you'd like to do. It's not an official page. But um, if you started to intermingle, for instance, stuff that has to do with the, the C3 and stuff that has to do with personal life and then personal views and then maybe something about work and then something, you know, and it's so, it, it becomes so, um, intertwine that work is a part of your personal page, that's when you want to be careful, right? If you've made a habit of keeping those things separate, um, you've, or you've got, you know, for instance, a blocked account, all that, although that doesn't totally save you, uh, it, it will help. But um, if you, you know, you've made a habit of kind of doing that and keeping work and, and keep separate, then I would say, yeah, you can, you can, you could, you could do that uh, on your private page, but you just want to be careful about intertwining work and personal so much that people start to get the impression that it's not you speaking; it's the organization. Okay, that's uh, the and and then on the issue of opening at the Democratic Convention, can I um ask you a question? Are you so so they want you to speak on behalf of your 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 organization your organization I believe no I mean I I was asked by by someone from the organization but I you know I, and we haven't really had a discussion about it so this webinar comes at a very perfect time um, so it would definitely be in my own capacity but as you know a vocal person in our region um, on political issues, and I and I also do use my Facebook to update people on legislative issues in in my work capacity. So they if they're, they are intermingled. Um, so I would be representing myself, but it could easily be taken. You know, once I'm back at the, you know, get out the native vote functions and things like that. You know, it, it's mm. kind of a fuzzy line there. Yeah, um, yeah, it is a fuzzy line, and um, a lot of times things are not necessarily about whether or not, as with this fact of circumstances test, it's not necessarily clear on what's right and what's wrong. But a lot of times, like I said, it's a smell test. It's how it looks um, that that's the problem, and it's the problem that is caused by uh, the perception. And if
if it does more damage to your your organization than it's worth, then I would suggest that you 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 know again it's it, it weigh the risk. Just be cautious and weighing the risk, and that's and that's what this is all about, right? It's not all about oh right. It's a, you know it's about risk. What what what's the tolerance for your what can your organization toler tolerate in terms of risk? And you may um, you know you you want to run things like that by your board of directors. You want to uh, talk to your board of directors before you engage in that. You want to think about funding. Very important. You know, and and funders get really um, um, sometimes, not all of them. Some, it's, but some funders can get really um, uh, 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 squeamish, if you will, um, when um, a C three gets too involved in, or is too associated with 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 political activity. So, but I mean, but you you know your organization. Some organizations, if there's nothing in black and white saying you can't do it, they're gonna go for it. And there are others that if it's nothing in black and white saying you can't you can do it, they're not going to do it. And um, it just depends on your risk tolerance. As far as speaking at that event, um, in your official capacity, I mean, if you're so and based on what you're you're telling me, it sounds as if you're kind. You're you're a very very outspoken leader, very intertwined not only with your community but with the organization. You might want to be careful about that because the assumption is going to to be. And again, I'm just looking at the facts and circumstances. You, if you're speaking at a party convention, at the Democratic Party convention, and they know, and everybody, everyone knows you as the, you know, executive director or the leader that you are in the community, they are linking your organization with the party, and they will see that as an endorsement. I think that's my personal. Uh, opinion based on looking at the facts and circumstances. So you might want to just kind of be just just be cognizant of that and be careful about it and just weigh the risks involved. Great, thank you for for that. Um, so we have a question from uh, Tasawi Marshall. Uh, the second part of the question is asking if the slides will be available for download, and we are going to uh, post a recording of this webinar and the, the slides um, on our nativevote.org website. So you'll be able to find them there uh, after, the, um, after the presentation, uh, as soon as we're able to get those up. Um, the first part of the question is, uh, we are a 501c6, a chamber of commerce. Do we fall under the C3 or C4 categories? Uh, it says, we are a membership-based organization driven by Native American-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Very good question. The 501c6 trade, uh, uh, the um, um, your organization, the uh, um, chambers of commerce, organizations like that, trade associations are under the C4 uh, rubric. So I would I would say that the legal framework um, for C4s is the same for a 501c6. So as a 501c6, you can support or oppose candidates. As long as it's not your primary activity, it has to be a secondary activity. But you know, in, indeed, you can engage in in that um, activity, um, and you can also lobby to an unlimited extent. So yes, uh, and you can do you know everything we talked about or discussed today in terms of C3s, you know, uh, voter registration and candidate education, all of those efforts. The Chamber of Commerce. Um, you can you can do that. You can um, engage in that activity. Everything a C three can do, you can do, and then some. Of course, you know you can. Um, of course, since you can support our post candidates, you can um, ask questions that may be leading in in your questionnaires. You can support candidates on your uh, Facebooks or, or Twitter, and you can, uh, frankly, just be more. Even if you don't get into endorsing candidates, because often I hear. Even with C4s, they 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 say, look, we don't endorse uh, candidates at all. But um, oftentimes, they come up against issues that they know as that as a C3, they could not or would be really um, hampered or uh, and restricted in their speech, and they want to be able to speak, you know, more vigorously and not have to worry about the the facts and circumstances. And so uh, as a C6, you, you have, you're, you're not as restricted um, 
in that regard and what you can say and not as restricted in your lobbying uh, efforts, for example. So, um, yeah, no, C6 and uh, C4s fall into to mainly the same kind of legal structure and category. Thank you, uh, Isaiah, for the answers to those questions. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, we are going to conclude the webinar at this point in time. I wanted to remind everyone, as Jackie shared, to uh, sign up to be involved at nativeboot.org. A lot of great resources, a uh, um, video presentation that we did at the Executive Council Winter Session in March. Uh, a range of other tools are posted on nativeboot.org. Uh, we also have the voter registration tool, which you can use in your communities immediately, which is posted on the main page. Uh, we will be launching some partnerships in the coming months and um, giving more details about that for our May webinar. So make sure you sign up to get involved and that you're on the distribution list for our Native Vote Listserv. Uh, and as Jackie mentioned, the youth curriculum is another great tool that you can share with folks in your local school systems. Uh, or even with uh, youth programming, boys and girls clubs, et cetera. Uh, thank you again for your participation. We look forward to working with you through the year. And if there are any other follow-up questions, do feel free uh, to contact me, Peter Morris, at pmorris at ncai.org or through the nativevote.org website. Thank you.